Hey, good morning, church. Come on in, come on in. Find a table, but don't sit down. Go ahead and stand up and let's begin reminding ourselves of truth, reminding us ourselves of uh, what our God has done. This morning, I want to start by reading a prayer that was actually written a long time ago um, with words that we're not super familiar with anymore, but um, I, let it be a, a time for your, your brain to kind of stop, to calm down, and to be like an obstacle so that you just don't run by the truth that, that is being spoken here. So if you want to close your eyes as you listen to this prayer, um, let it be a reminder of what our God has done. My Father, enlarge my heart and warm my affections, open my lips, supply words that proclaim love lusters at Calvary. Their grace removes my burden and heaps them on thy son. Made a transgressor, a curse and a sin for me. There the sword of thy justice smote the man. There thy infinite attributes were magnified, and infinite atonement was made. There infinite punishment was due, and infinite punishment was endured. Christ was all anguish, that I might be all joy. Cast off, that I might be brought in. Trodden down as an enemy, that I might be welcomed as a friend. Surrendered to hell's worst, that I might attain heaven's best. Stripped that I might be clothed, wounded that I might be healed, a thirst that I might drink, tormented that I might be comforted, made a shame that I might inherit glory, entered darkness that I might have eternal light. My Savior wept that all tears might be wiped from my eyes. He groaned that I might have an endless song, he endured all pain that I might have eternal health. He bore a thorny crown that I might have a glory diadem and bowed his head that I might uplift mine. Experienced reproach that I might receive welcome. Closed his eyes in death that I might gaze on an unclouded brightness. Expired that I might forever live. O Father, who spared not thine only Son, that thou mightest spare me. All this transfer thy love designed and accomplished. Help me to adore thee by my lips and my life. O oh, that every breath might be ecstatic praise, my every step buoyant with delight. As I see my enemies crushed, Satan baffled, defeated, destroyed, hell's gates closed, heaven's portal open. Go forth, O conquering God, and show me the cross, mighty to subdue, mighty to comfort, and mighty to save. That's the love our God has shown us in the work of Jesus Christ. Let's sing about that.
salvation and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes if his grace is an ocean we're all sinking and heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest and I don't Psalm 105, verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name and make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him and sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are all are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Let's praise that name the name of the Lord, our God. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound, drenched in tears, they laid him down in joy. By heavy storm, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name for.
see the wonders of the glory of this mystery. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Thank you, God, for delivering us so that we could sing that kind of praise to your name. Open our hearts this morning. Open our hearts, Father, to receive the word of God, the living word, the active word that pierces all the way down to the deepest part of our soul that exposes and and then treats and then cures and heals and changes and transforms, Lord. Thank you for this word today. And let it come alive in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to be in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16 will be our theme verse, our main verse. We're going to start reading in John chapter 3, verse 14. If you're visiting with us this morning, thank you for being here. My name is John Melton. I'm one of the pastors at First Baptist. Bob Schneider is our other pastor. He is on vacation right now, and I think this might be his first real vacation all year. So a well-deserved vacation for him. I'm glad to be here. We are going to be um, stepping into a new sermon series on evangelism, I want to begin by reading from John chapter 3. I'm going to begin in verse 14.
It says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may, may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. God has spoken this morning. Whenever the the word evangelism is mentioned, there's all kinds of responses that come out of us. I've got my own. You probably have your own. And unless you're absolutely like gifted with evangelism, you probably respond to the idea of evangelism uh, the way you respond to the idea of going to the doctor. Fear, trepidation. I, um, I came across this quote from Becky, Rebecca Pippert is her name. She wrote a book called Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World, Evangelism is a Way of Life. 1979, so this book came out. And here's her quote. Here's what she says. Christians and non-Christians have something in common. We're both uptight about evangelism. I did a little poll this week. I asked about 15 or so people this question. What keeps you from sharing the gospel? Here were some of the answers I got from folks. Someone said, well, what keeps me from sharing the gospel is if it's someone I don't know, I might make them feel awkward. Or if it's someone I do know, I might hurt the relationship or they might see me differently. Someone else said, when I asked what keeps you from sharing the gospel, he said, well, when I put myself in their shoes, I think I wouldn't want to be evangelized. Someone else said, I'm just too busy and preoccupied with life. I, I, I'm not intentional about it. I get distracted by other things so that when the opportunity presents itself, I'm not there. I'm not ready. One person said, a lack of love for other people keeps me from sharing the gospel. Another person said, hatred for certain people keeps me from sharing the gospel. Few said apathy, I just don't care, unbelief. One person said this, I'm afraid I'm going to be challenged and not be able to have a good answer to give. That keeps me from sharing. Or, um, I'm afraid I'll give Christians a bad name if I share, because I don't know what to say. I don't know how to start the conversation. I'm not like Pastor Bob. I don't practice it enough to do it, or do it enough to be comfortable And then I ask, what keeps you from sharing the gospel with someone? And this person says, well, they didn't ask. I feel if they want to know, they'll ask. And that kind of keeps me from sharing. All kinds of reasons. And and I can boil it down really to three, I think, main reasons that we don't share the gospel and we don't evangelize. Fear, guilt, and ineptitude. We don't feel qualified, we feel guilty about it, and we're afraid. And I want to say that, 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 that the, the bottom line to these issues of fear, guilt, and ineptitude, if we would just be honest, I think we should see this, that they are mainly rooted in our selfishness and our sin and our self-protection. That's really the bottom line about our, of not evangelizing and what keeps us from sharing the, the gospel with people. But the answer to poor evangelism is not a bigger guilt trip. It's not... A, a heavy scolding. Uh, I, don't, I don't do well when I, I, I've been under guilt trips by pastors for not evangelizing. It, 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 it works very temporarily. And what I find is God does not use guilt trips to get me to do the things he wants me to do. 
He doesn't give heavy scoldings. He's not harsh. He asks me to be honest about what's really wrong, and when I get honest about it, because I, I am not one who's standing here as the, the uh, model evangelist. If anything else, I am one of the worst models before you. But I'm honest in the fact that it is sin that keeps me from doing it. I'm not, that's not a guilt trip, that's truth. So what God calls me to do now is to learn how to evangelize like Jesus. And that's the, t- that's the sermon series for, for the series. Evangelism according to Jesus. Listen, evangelism, first and foremost, it is not a presentation or a proclamation. Don't get me wrong. The, 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 the gospel must be proclaimed and it must be presented, but that is not primarily what evangelism is. Evangelism is way much more Because the word evangel comes from the root good news, good message. We've now turned it to the word gospel, which means good story. It's a good news, but it's way better than just something we present. It's not a presentation, it's a power. It's a power that takes a, a life and changes the whole trajectory of that life. That's what the gospel, that's what good news is. The Apostle Paul says, Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul was not kept from sharing the gospel. Why, Paul? Why were you not ashamed of the gospel? Because it's the power of God. It's not the presentation of God. It's the power of God. It actually takes and turns and transforms a life, a miserable life, and makes it happy, true happy, truly happy. And that means for me, here's what this means. The starting point for evangelism and for sharing the gospel with anybody does not begin with me or with me loving other people. You, you can't begin evangelism starting with yourself or with, with actually, you can't even begin starting by learning to love other people. That's not where evangelism starts. Evangelism, evangelism begins by learning the love God has for you. Not by you learning to love other people, by learning the love God has for you, by knowing how loved you are and how loved other people around you are. You start seeing the way God loves people, that will begin to change your view and your evangelism, your, in fact, your whole motivation for sharing the gospel. 1 John 4 verse 8 says, anyone who does not love God doesn't know God. Because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, in this is love. Not that we love God. It's not that we love God that we find love. In this is love, that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In Paul Miller, in his book, Love Walked Among Us, He says this, love begins not with loving, but with being loved. Being loved gives you the freedom and the resources to love. We can only give what we've received. So if you haven't really, truly been loved and know what it means to be loved by a father whose love you don't really deserve, but you are, you're just not going to have any resources or a pool to draw from to give And so we, we're going to look at this, we're going to look at the gospel, and, and the series is meant, over the next few weeks, is, is meant to help prepare and practically show us, equip us how to share the gospel using the acronym of gospel, G-O-S-P-E-L. I'm starting with the G today, and the G stands for God, because sharing the gospel must begin with God and his character today. John 3.16 will be our starting point, the most memorized verse of the Bible. The most memorized verse of the Bible, John 3.16. They said back in, I can't remember what year it was, but when Tim Tebow was playing for the Denver Broncos and he was taking the team to the, through the playoffs, after the first playoff game against the Steelers, which they won amazingly, Tebow, you know, he had under his eyes, I forget what you call those, that kind of blocked the sun. It said John 3.16. That was the verse that was in those. 
They said after that game that Google uh, recorded 94 million hits saying, what does John 3.16 mean? <laughs> Which kind of floored me because I kind of thought everybody knew what John 3.16 was because everybody seems to be able to recite it. We can recite it in our sleep. What I want to do this morning is take what is so familiar and has become overly familiar to us and deeply plunge down and really, really get into the bottom and the heart of what God so loved the world really is the power that's behind it and actually start believing that power that's in this passage, in this verse. So I've got three points today. We're going we're to take it from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I'm just going to take for God so loved the world and break it into three things to this morning. We're going to look at, at the world God loves. We're going to look at the world God loves. We need to understand the world that he loves. And then we need to look at the way God loves. And then finally, we'll see the work that God loves. And there is a work God loves. So let's begin with the world that God loves. For God so loved the world. By looking at the verse, for God, the word for is there to remind us that for is there for some reason. And what that reason is points back to what's happened in John chapter 3. So when we go back to John 3, what we find, and many of you know this, is a discussion between a very famous Pharisee and Jesus Christ. His name was Nicodemus, and he wasn't just a Pharisee, meaning he didn't just know the Old Testament and understand it. He was a ruler of the Pharisees, it tells us. So this man is very significant in the, in the community of the Pharisees, for one. And he's coming to Jesus at night because he's very intrigued by Jesus because he said forthright, he said, when he got to Jesus and he met him, he said, I know you must be from God because no one can do the things you do and not be from God. And what's interesting is that Jesus did not address that comment that Nicodemus gave. He did not say, you're right, Nicodemus. I'm glad you're here, Nicodemus. I have some things to teach you. He didn't start that way. In fact, he absolutely shatters what I believe was Nicodemus' whole worldview coming to Jesus. And in verse 3, he says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, what he's really saying there is, Nicodemus, you need to listen to what I'm about to tell you. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we just sang this while ago. Love like, love, the love of God is like a hurricane, and I'm like a tree. That is really what, G, what, what Jesus is for Nicodemus right here. He is not chipping away at, at Nicodemus' belief system right now. I believe Nicodemus came to Jesus and had no doubt in his mind that he was going to see the kingdom of God. He was the most religious, probably one of the most religious men in the community. He knew God. He knew his Bible. He kept the law. There was no question this man is going to see the kingdom of heaven in his eyes. And Jesus comes in like a hurricane, category five hurricane, and absolutely devastates his belief system with the most simple illustration in that of birth. Unless you're born again, Nicodemus, you will never see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus doesn't get it. It doesn't make sense to him. He doesn't understand. And so he gets to verse, um, verse 9 and he says to Jesus, how can these things be? He's frustrated. He doesn't get it. And so what Jesus does is he turns to a, a very familiar story in the Old Testament, one that Nicodemus would know. It's found in Numbers chapter 21. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And he, what he's doing is he's referencing uh, what happens in Numbers 21 after the Israelites have been miraculously saved out of Egypt. And I'm going to pick this up. We're going to look at Numbers 21, four, starting verse 4. It says that they set out, the Israelites set out by the way of the Red Sea, and the people became impatient on the way, which is one of the biggest understatements in the e ESV right there. They became impatient on the way. They are the epitome of impatience. Are they not, the Israelites? And they spoke, this people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we hate this worthless, this worthless food. And you hear what they're saying. God who has provided everything they need for them and has given them bread from heaven and they're calling it worthless 
and they're accusing God for giving it to them. This is the world that God so loved. I want you, just want you to understand that the world that God loves is a world that treats him like this. In John chapter 3, in verse 18, two verses after verse 16, he says, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. That's the world, church. The world around us that does not believe in Jesus, is not, it's not that they're going to be condemned one day and cast off. They're condemned at this moment, already condemned. And Jesus said, listen, the judgment is here. The light has come to the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. That's the condition of the world. They don't, it's not that they're looking for light. They hate it. And that's the world Jesus, the God loves. And that's why in verse 36, he says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life for the wrath of God remains on him. Listen, this world God loves is in darkness. And, it's, and hear, hear what this, what the, what, what's happening um, in, in Israel back in the Exodus is that the people, it's not the fact that they are offending God, but they are denying their offense to God. That's that, that, I believe, is at the bottom root of what is so offensive to God. Not just the offense, not just the rebellion or the defiance or the self-righteousness, but the denial of it and the denial of God's existence. You see, if you have a friend or maybe even a spouse and they wrong you, they wrong you, and then they pretend like it never happened, what happens to that relationship? Well, it get, it, it's different, isn't it? In fact, it starts to grow further apart. And when you start seeing that, that the person that has offended you is pretending like nothing happened, and you see this relationship growing apart, what is it that's bothering you? It's not just the offense. It's the denial of the offense, isn't it? They're, they're not coming forth. They're not seeing it. And Ray Ortland says this, our willful denial of God is the mega offense above all other offenses. Our willful denial of God. Our world is too good for God. It's too touchy and defensive to accept his love. But that does not stop God. <laughs> Praise God. He is not put off by our denial. This world, this is the world God so loved. A world not just in rebellion, but in denial and already condemned. Now, that's the world God loves. Now, watch the way God loves this world. Watch the way he loves. Point two. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, let's go back to Numbers. Let's go back to Numbers, get back into our storyline, and let's pick up where, where, where they left off. The, the, the Israelites are in incessant complaining. And so verse 6 says, The Lord then sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. Some people say they can, they can accept the God of the Bible as a God of love but they cannot accept the God of wrath that they see in verses like this. How is this God, a God of wrath, a God who loves? How can a loving God do things like this? How can a loving God allow the injustices that are going on in this Old Testament we read about, the mistreatment of people, the mistreatment of nations, the, the slaughter, the devastation of whole people groups, how can that kind of a God you call as loving be love? I don't get that. And it's clear that when they see, that, see God that way, they don't understand the love of God. I'm going to show you why that the wrath of God and the love of God are not opposites. They are, they are inseparable. But in our lives, love and wrath are separable. <laughs> they are separable. I'll give you, I'll, give you, I'll show you how. See, we, we can't understand wrath being love. Because, uh, 
Say when you get angry. Any of you ever get angry? Sure you do. I bet one of these three things happens, makes you angry. One, when something stands in the way of your happiness. Or two, when something stands in the way of your comfort. Or three, when something stands in the way of you looking good. If anybody disrupts any one of those three, your happiness, your comfort, or you looking good, you'll get angry. And what happens is we vent our wrath when those things happen to us, don't we? We vent our wrath. And after we vent our wrath and it comes out, guess what happens to us? We get embarrassed. We feel shame. Because we acted out of sheer foolishness. We love ourselves so much that when we don't get our way, we just blow up. And many people project their own wrath on God and say, I don't want to be like that God. Because they think God is like them. And God ain't nothing like us. He is nothing like us. His wrath is nothing. You, that's the problem. We think God acts out in anger the way we act out in anger. That's the way the world sees God's wrath separated from God's love. But the Bible teaches us that the opposite of God's love is not his wrath, but that his wrath is actually bound up in his love. The reason people think God's love and wrath are mutually exclusive is because they bought into the lie that began in Genesis 3 when Satan lied to the woman in the garden. That's where every mistreatment of humanity, every injustice comes from. It comes from the lie that was bought and believed and the disobedience that occurred as a result. God told Adam, listen, you can eat of any fruit in this garden, but do not eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you do, in the day you do, you will surely die. That's all he told them. That's all they needed to know. And Satan comes to them, and what does he do? He denies God. Did God really say that? You will not surely die and in one small script, he's right. There's, that's the way Satan works. He gives you a little bit of truth. Because the day that Eve uh, ate, the, ate the fruit, she didn't die immediately, physically. But see, what Satan didn't tell her is, Eve, when you eat the fruit, every impulse, every impulse of your heart towards God will die. Satan didn't tell her that. Satan didn't tell you, hey, honey, as soon as you eat that fruit, you remember, that, remember that, that feeling you had when you woke up in the morning and you went looking for Adam and you ran out to them and you couldn't wait to work with him and you couldn't wait to, to help him and you couldn't wait to submit to him and you just, you just long for that? He didn't tell her about it. That's going to die. He didn't tell her that. He didn't tell her that impulse would die. He didn't tell her, hey, your husband who just absolutely adores you and loves you and wants to nurture and take care of you and can't wait for you to come out and help work with him. He loves working with you. In fact, he is for you. That's going to die. He didn't tell her that. He's a deceiver to the core. And Adam... And his wife should have known when God says, the day you eat it, you will surely die. That was enough to believe. They didn't need to know what was going to die. They just needed to love God enough to obey him. And they didn't. And ever since, every, every human being since has been in denial. It's the first sin Adam and Eve committed. They denied their sin. Blamed it on the other. And because of this, God's wrath remains on them. And that should tell people how much God loves them. Let me explain this. I am not going, this, this, this just really helped me understand a whole new level of God's love for me. I never saw this before. Rebecca Pippert, I read earlier, 
she shares a story about two friends that she had. They were very close friends. But they began to sink deep into drug abuse. They got caught up in the wrong crowd. And she says, whenever I was around them, I felt fury. Fury! Everything in me wanted to shake them and say, can you not see? <laughs> Don't you know what you're doing to yourself? You become less and less yourself every time I see you. Real love, she says, stands against deception, against the lie, against the sin that destroys. Look at this. Anger and love are inseparably bound in human experience, she writes. And if I, a flawed, narcissistic, and sinful woman, can feel this much pain and anger over someone's condition, how much more? How much more a morally perfect God who made them? Anger isn't the opposite of love. Hate is the opposite of love, and the final form of hate is indifference. Listen, you, you go, boy, you go up to a parent whose child is a prodigal child, just straight away, just slander that parent. You go up to that parent and you say, hey, how are you doing? How are things going with you and, and your family? And, and you say, oh, my wife and I, we're going to take a vacation here. We're headed to Florida next month. I said, well, how about your son who, who left? Oh, boys will be boys. You know, they're sowing their wild oats. It's just that season of life, you know. They'll get, they're going to just make their bed and lie in it. That's not love. That's indifference. That's denial. That's darkness. See, a true parent whose child has left is furious. Because he loves that child. He hates what's happening to that child. He hates where that child is headed. He knows there's destruction ahead, and that's how much more God loves this world that's headed on a collision course with hell. His wrath is an expression of his love. It's not the opposite of his love. And here's the deal. The world around you, as they are still alive and kicking and have a pulse, God's wrath remains on them, and that's his love for them. And that's why evangelism is so urgently needed. We need to understand the love God has had for us. Do you realize God's wrath remained on you? Do you know that? God's wrath was on you. You were condemned at one time before you believed in the Son and what He did for you. You were that person. I was that person. Romans 1 tells us that He is going to reveal His wrath on all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And he wants them to turn and see what he has done for them. And that leads us to the last point. And that's this. We've seen the world God loves. And we've seen the way God loves. That his wrath is not indifferent to his love. His wrath shows and proves his love for this world. But now let's look at the work God loves. There is a work that he loves. That takes us back to 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And in Numbers 21, back to Numbers 21 again, verse 7, it says, The people came to Moses after they were bit by the serpents, after God's wrath had been poured out upon them. And they said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, if he would look at the bronze serpent, he would live. Do you see it? Did you see it? The bronze serpent was a picture of the one. Through whom sin and denial is rooted. Do you see this? Why a serpent? Why lift up a serpent? Because the serpent, before their eyes, if they would look at it, what they would see is they would see their sin against God. Because it was a serpent who lied and deceived us to believe God is not good, God does not love us, and by looking at the serpent, they were agreeing, God, that's my sin. And just the sheer act of believing God's promise, if you look at the serpent, you'll live, they did. God's love for them but that serpent, all it did was it gave them physical life. But when God lifted up his one and only son, 
on the cross. He was lifting up a different form of the serpent. You see, when Jesus was lifted up, what we see is our sin. In fact, when you visualize Jesus on the cross, bleeding, suffering, anguishing, crying out, do you see your face on the cross? Look at the cross someday. You think about this visual picture you've had of Jesus. It's a movie you've seen or some book you've read. And, and don't, don't look at that face. Look at your face because that should, that's you hanging on that cross. And Jesus, the Son of God, God loved you so much, he put Jesus in your place. And then he poured out all of his wrath on him. And whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. That's what the word propitiation means in 1 John 4.10. The Son of God is our propitiation for our sin. It's a big word, but it's pretty, pretty easy to understand. It's the word propitious, which means favorable. God is favorable to you. Pro, pitiate, pro means for. He's for you. Here's how he's for you. He makes Jesus the wrath absorber in your place. That's what propitiation means. He's your wrath absorber. And when you look up, you can behold the Lamb of God who was slain for you on the cross. You can see yourself and say, I should be there and Jesus is in my place. He was slain for me. My offenses and my denials. You are so loved. We are so loved. So here's evangelism according to Jesus. I'm going to have the team come back up. We'll close with a response song to sing in response to Jesus for what he's done. Here's evangelism according to Jesus. 1 John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So our evangelism begins with our love right here in this room, or right here in this local church, with one another. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't start with the world. He starts with one another. That's where we learn evangelism. And then from there, 1 uh, John 12 Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus has promised when he is lifted up and he already, and those who believe God's promise and look on him, they will live when they see what he has done for them. It is the love God has for us. It is the love God has for this world revealed in his fierce wrath over sin, but in even greater measure revealed in his son, whom he lifted up and poured his wrath out in our place. Therefore, our response is, lift him up. When it says that, that it, Moses raised up the, that lifted up the serpent, but Jesus, the son of man, will be lifted up, it wasn't just the fact he would be lifted up to die, but that he would also be lifted up to be exalted. Jesus is high and lifted up now and our evangelism is really just simply our worship of proclaiming what he's done. And when we do, we pray that God draw the lost to himself. So let's respond. Would you stand this morning, church, and just sing the song as a response to him? Father's arms are open wide for 
That's, that's your call. Tell the world the treasure you found. Here's your question. What's keeping you from sharing the gospel this week? What's keeping you from sharing the gospel today? Ask yourself. Be honest. Confess. Repent. Ask God to show you the love he has for you. But here's my other question for some of you in this room. It's not what's keeping you from sharing the gospel. It's what's keeping you from the love of the Father for you. 
What's keeping you from receiving his love? What's keeping you from arms that are wide open and you come into the altar and giving your life to him? Don't, don't, don't miss it. He loves you. He loves you. He created you in his image and he loves you. And he wants you to know he's lifted up his son for you. So come to the altar. I'm, I'm here this morning. There's prayer benches and I'll pray with you if you'd like to pray. If you need some prayer, please, let's do it this morning. But don't, don't not respond to God. All right. Thank you for joining us. We thank those on live stream that are with us in the recording. Thank you for being here this morning, church. Grace be with you.